All right, good evening, folks. Um, I'm less than one sugar victor. Um, about three years ago, I decided to try my hand at uh, Meteor Scatter. Um, I had a, a witnessed it up on Mount Greylock operating with the W2SZ folks, but you know, seeing it and doing it are sort of two different things. Um, I first started on six meters, and as I gained some confidence, I tried two meters, and then most recently, uh, 222 megahertz. Um, I'm by no means uh, an expert, but I thought it might be interesting to sort of relate uh, some of my experiences and what I learned in the hopes that maybe somebody else might give it a try. So tonight we'll talk a little bit about just simple definitions. Uh, I'll show you some of the history of meteor scatter, talk a little bit about how it works. I'll show you some examples of pings. We'll talk about the distances that are possible and some of the uh, the difficulties between the different bands. We'll take a look at the MSK 144 protocol to we'll talk briefly about meteor showers. I'm still learning about those. Uh, show you some examples of meteor sc scatter contacts I've made. We'll look at some basic station setups. Chances are if you operate FT8 on six meters, you already have what you need. Um, we'll look at a couple of online uh, scheduling resources that are handy. Uh, and I'll show you uh, a project that I'm that I'm that I'm still working on. So definitions. So a meteoroid basically is uh, a space object that's uh, anywhere from something small uh, as a as a grain to uh, to small asteroids and uh, and anything anything in between. Uh, a meteor would be a meteoroid that uh, burns up in the E layer of the atmosphere, and a meteorite is is basically one that uh, a meteoroid that makes it all the way to Earth. Um, sort of a fun fact here is, is that uh, there's an estimated 25 million meteoroids, micrometeoroids, and other space debris uh, that enters the atmosphere daily, resulting in an estimated 15,000 tons of material that enters the atmosphere each year. So the takeaway here is there are a lot of opportunities to work meteor scatter. There's a lot of stuff entering the atmosphere. So a little history. As far back as 1953, uh, there were uh, reports of, of meteor scatter. So here's a, a cover from QST from 53. And I don't know if you can see that, but the very bottom says, this issue, extended range communications via meteor scatter, is basically uh, an article about two California hams that were on, uh, I guess, 15 or 20 meters and uh, uh, apparently a, like a dead band and they were able to work each other. Uh, and they, I think, discovered uh, for the first time what meteor scatter was. So that was, that was like the first time. In the 60s and 70s, the Europeans pioneered high speed CW, which, you know, today I think seems a little bit archaic the way they did it. They used modified tape recorders. And so what they, they would do is they would tape record uh, CW and then play it back at really high speed into their transmitter and then receive it the same way uh, and then slow it down and decode it by ear. And so the speeds that they, they had were like a thousand words a minute. Yes. I believe it was, it was uh, audio. So, uh, so the interesting thing here is that if you think about the way they had to do it, it's like, you know, Neanderthal stuff, you know, so you, you, you basically, you have to send a signal uh, and you're, you're playing this tape recorder and you're transmitting a signal and a distant station is recording it. Then he's got to like play it back at a slower speed. Then he's got to copy it. And then he's got to respond and do the same thing back. Can you imagine how long a contact must have taken? But they, but they did it for, uh, I guess, more than a decade. So it's just amazing. Um, but in 2001, Joe Taylor came out with FSK 441, and that really revolutionized everything. You know, now you could basically do it real time. Um, you know, he, he came out with a with a with a program a WSJT and um, uh, like I say that 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 really really revolutionized uh, meteor scatter 
Um, and people still use it today. But in 2017, he came out with MSK 144, uh, you know, which has got improved performance. He, he credits that to the advancement in personal com computing technology. Uh, and, and now it's, like I say, it's a de facto standard. It's, it's widely used. It's in uh, WSJT, WSJTX. Digital, digital mode. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so so that's that's a a little bit of a history of, of meteor scatter. It's, it, these are designed specifically for VHF meteor scatter. That's sort of interesting. Uh, how does meteor scatter work? So you know, uh, meteors are created uh, uh, are ionized particles in the E layer, and these these particles persist for up to several seconds. Uh, and, and, and the trails uh, are very dense and they can support radio waves. Uh, and the VHF range, typically 30 to 300. Um, although I guess some people have actually done it on 432, I think. But um, I'm not 100% positive on that. And the duration, duration and density of the trails is dependent on the size of the meteor and the angle it enters the atmosphere. And I guess a, a little bit about the speed at which it, it's entering as well. Um, so these are like not high angle uh, entries to the atmosphere. They're, they're, they're basically glancing blows you can think of. And so the, the uh, basically the example here is you look at like this meteor here that's coming in. And you have a master station on the left who's transmitting, okay? And he's hoping that, uh, whoops, that a, a, piece of his, a piece of his signal scatters off the, the incoming meteor and goes to the slave, one of the slave stations. Uh, and the slave station hears it and basically will, will respond. Um, so, you know, it's, it's basically, um, it doesn't happen very long and to be able to make a contact could take five minutes, could take an hour. It really depends on how many meteors are ent entering the atmosphere. So um, that's, that's basically how it works. Any questions? Okay. So here are some examples of, of pings. If, if you were to, to turn on your VHF receiver uh, and you were listening for, for meteors, you'd actually hear pings. And so that's sort of why they call them pings. So here's some examples of pings. Uh, these are taken from, these are basically waterfalls from WSJTX on, on two meters. And, and you can see each one basically, uh, you can get an idea of the meteor starting to burn up uh, and then decaying. And so like an example one, uh, you know, you have some good intensity. Um, notice that, you know, in all four of these, the, uh, the meteor is, uh, is significantly above the threshold. Now, this is not a uh, weak signal work. Basically, it's, it's either there or it's not there. So the, the, a lot of people don't use preamps. There's really not a need for that. Um, you can see the difference in the duration of the pings. Some are longer, some are shorter. Um, obviously, the like example three is a is a great one. We would we would easily be able to to send or or receive a transmission there. Uh, distance is possible. So here on the right is a uh, a map of from Grid Tracker. Uh, I don't know who, how many people use Grid Tracker. But it's a it's a really neat program. Um, you, you load it with an ADIF file from your log, and then if you have it open, it 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 will indicate uh, spots, uh, um, packet spots, and as you as you work people, it'll auto populate. Um, so it's a it's a really neat program. And so what you're seeing here is basically a, a two meter map. In red are the, the grids that I've confirmed, and in yellow, those that I've worked but haven't confirmed. And I sort of use this to sort of show like the, the 
theoretical maximum range for meteor scatter, which is about 1,400 miles. Um, and, the, and the minimum is, it can be thought of something just beyond what you could normally work, like say three, 400 miles. Um, yeah, regardless of frequency. So um, the problem with like trying to work somebody close is chances are you're going to decode him direct. So you want to make sure that the person is far enough away that if you work him, you know it's really meteor scattered. So, you know, 400 miles is probably a good threshold. If, if you're farther than that, chances are it's meteor scatter. Although, if you, if you look at some of these, some of these grids down here, um, those are, that's a, a, some, a tropo opening. Uh, but most of the other ones are meteor scatter. So you can see, um, you know, way out, way out here, Echo Mary, what, Echo Mary 25, Echo Mary 25 there is, uh, is, is, a, is a nice haul. That's a, about 1,400 miles or, or close to it. Um, up here in the, in the upper left corner, 1,400 miles represents Minnesota. Uh, down at the, the southern tip of Florida is, is only 1,300 miles. So, you know, you can work pretty far um, using meteor scatter. Um, best times to work meteor scatter are just past midnight to I should say dawn to just past midnight. Um, some things to remember, uh, if you're trying to work a station to the west or to the south, you typically transmit on the odd sequences. The, the typical sequence is, is 15 seconds. So um, if I'm working uh, out to the west, I'm gonna be transmitting uh, from 15 to 29 and, and 45 to 59 of each minute. You're listening to the, the other times. Uh, the six meter calling frequency is 50.260, two meters is 144.150, and uh, as close as I can tell, 222 is 222.085. Now, the thing about the different bands, six meters is the easiest band to experiment with for meteor scatter. It's a very forgiving band. It, it has the, the, the greatest duration for a ping. When you move from six meters to two meters, the pings are one eighth what they are on six meters. So if you have a two second ping on six meters, that's a 250 millisecond ping on two meters. So the difficulty level for two meters is much greater than six meters for that reason. So you need a much longer ping. And on 222 megahertz, it's even more difficult. So you can you can see you can see the challenge. Uh, let's take a, a look at the MSK one forty four protocol. Here's some facts on the left: uh, minimum shift keying, uh, strong error correction, thirteen character payload. Um, there's two different uh, message formats. One is a standard message format that's transmitted within uh, seventy two milliseconds, and then there's an optional shortened message format, which is only 20 milliseconds. And the way that works is they replace the call signs with a hash of the string of both call signs. So if you look in the upper right is a, is a, a QSO using the standard message format. Uh, you know, I send CQ, a station responds with a signal report. Uh, I respond uh, uh, confirming the report and giving mine. Uh, the distance station uh, confirms that I send 73, he sends 73, and that's basically a contact. Um, so you can see here, it, uh, in order to make a, a successful contact, I need six meteors. So it, it could take a while, or it may not. It just depends on, on meteors. Um, using the shortened message format, you see after we both make contact, our, our call signs are replaced by the hash. And from that point on, um, it understands that if if those were the, con the the call signs that preceded it, they must be the call signs that you're that you're using. Uh, it's not foolproof, um, but it seems to work. You don't see what? 
No, uh, th that's the other thing. Um, uh, you're right, you're right. That doesn't always happen. I think uh, I think the grid is optional. You can save a um, you can save a transmission if you don't send the grid. Right. And you may do that if you've scheduled the contact. If I know I'm working K0 TPP out in Echo Mary 25, I don't really need to know that. But if I'm sending CQ, I got to send something, right? Um, I said before about uh, uh, 72 milliseconds and 20 milliseconds. That's for each transmission. So if you think about it, in, 15, in a 15 second a TR sequence, I'm sending my transmission over and over and over again. Okay, so like, if you happen to hear somebody direct, you'll see all these decodes. You'll see 15 seconds worth of decodes, over, same message over and over and over again. So you, but what you're hoping in, with meteor scatter is one of those 72 millisecond decodes hit a meteor. Now, when you get like a, a really good size meteor, you'll see like multiple decodes. I'll say like K0 TPP will have three or four decodes. And that's sort of neat to see. Oh, geez, that's a, that's a, a big ping because it was long enough to have multiple decodes. So that's a neat thing to, to look at. So uh, again, um, it's, it's, it's what fits into to 15 seconds. So you could have you know, a large meteor or you could have multiple meteors, but you'll see the multiple decodes. Yeah, so it's sort of neat. Um, and so people like to use the, the short message format on two meters and above because it allows you to, to take advantage of the smaller meteors. So now with a normal message format, you know, it, you, you, the meteor has got to be there long enough that your 72 milliseconds gets through. So now with 20 milliseconds, now you can take advantage of smaller meteors. So on two meters, they use what they call contest mode and shortened message format. So, so contest mode is basically no, no grids. You know, it's basically just a, I should say, a, no signal reports, just grids or something like that. I'm trying to remember which one. Um, but it, 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 it uses fewer, uh, fewer transmissions, basically. Uh, I, I mentioned that the, uh, one of the, the, the neat things about uh, the, the pings that I showed you were that they were all significantly above the threshold, the, the, the noise floor. Um, you see here the minimum decode threshold is minus eight. So it's definitely not weak signal. And, the, and this TR sequence I mentioned before is 15 seconds. Uh, meteor showers, um, here's sort of a list of them. Uh, I've sort of highlighted the ones uh, that are the most popular. The Perseids are the most popular. This is basically when you have a, a lot of meteors that are bombarding the Earth uh, at a, a period of time. Um, Perseids uh, is, uh, is a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people will get on for the peak of the Perseids you know, usually a couple of nights, uh, and it can be, it can get like really busy, which is sort of neat. Uh, I also operated the uh, the Geminids uh, uh, this uh, this fall, this winter. Um, that was interesting, uh, but that I haven't operated any of the other ones so far. But um, this is sort of a list of them. I mean, you don't need to have a meteor shower to work meteor scatter. Uh, there are a lot of weekends that I'll get on, you know, real early on a Saturday or a Sunday morning and only have like an hour and I'll eat breakfast down in the shack and I'll work out into like Michigan or something or, or Illinois on, on two meters. So, you know, you don't need a, a meteor shower, but it's really helpful. Here are some examples of some a two meter uh, meteor scatter contacts I made during the Perseids. So uh, if, if you look uh, on, the, on the left graphic, uh, you have band activity, which is uh, what I'm receiving, and then my, my transmitted messages. Uh, you can see on the left, there's uh, 
uh, a station WB4JWM in Echo Mary 83. So uh, he's at uh, about almost 900 miles. You can see the transmission there. You see, uh, let's see, one, two, three, the fourth line in, in red from the top. Uh, you can see that there's a, a shortened message format there. You can see the uh, 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 the brackets around the, around the call signs. You can also see at the same time I'm getting called by K3SK and FM07. Um, but yeah, that's that's a sort of interesting. So this is this is two meters. On the right is uh, uh, WA4 GPM and Echo Mary uh, 90. Uh, in Florida, just over a thousand miles, uh, and you can see other stations. Uh, AC4TO is is transmitting, and uh, a local station uh, WNVD uh, in FN31. Uh, there's lots of activity during Perseids, so I think I worked, you know, a handful of stations in the I don't know Florida, Georgia area, you know. Um, you know, maybe one in the Midwest, all on two meters. So uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, basic station setup. So if you have uh, a six meter radio, any sort of rotatable antenna, and a, a computer with a sound card, you basically have everything you need to work meteor scatter on six meters. So if you're working FT8 right now, uh, and you have a rotatable beam, there's no reason why you can't work meteor scatter. One of the easiest ways to get involved is basically to get on early in the morning, turn your into southwest or west, uh, in turn on WSJTX to MSK144, and put your radio on 50.260, and just listen, just see if you can decode anybody. You know, you remember what I said about the sequences. Uh, folks out to the to the west are going to be on the on the evens, and folks transmitting to the west or, or to the south are are, are going to be on the odds. I mean, you you can use high power, but you don't really need it. You know, one of the problems, however, uh, when six meters is open, is trying to differentiate between uh, a sporadic e opening. Right and meteor scatter so obviously it works well when the band's dead <laughs> um two meters um uh, i worked a lot with 100 watts and uh i have a, a pair of uh, i guess a pair of 12 element yagis I, I think that's what they are um but you know with a single yagi and 100 watts you, you can have a lot of fun uh you know you can you can you can work a whole bunch of stations you know, you don't need to have a lot of power. It does help, but um, I worked a number of stations before I got my amplifier. So again, if you have a radio and a sound card and a, and a computer and a, and a single rotatable at Yagi, you pretty much have what you need to get started. That's sort of the, the neat thing about WSJTX. You know, it's, it's packed full of different protocols. Uh, here are a couple of scheduling resources that you can find online. Uh, one is uh, Ping Jockey. So Ping Jockey is, is neat. Uh, you can get on there and you can post messages. You know, you can tell people that you want to work somebody or you're, you know, you're transmitting on a, a certain band, certain frequency in a certain direction, and people will listen for you. Uh, there are a lot of uh, well-educated meteor scatter people that you can ask questions of. Um, again, most active times are going to be, uh, you know, early morning, uh, you know, late evenings, you know, like nine or ten o'clock. Of course, uh, if there's a, a, a meteor shower, that it'll be all night. Uh, and on the right is is the ONK ON4KST uh, chat rooms. So uh, obviously, here you'd, you'd probably want to use the the six meter region two and the and the two meter 432 region two. Um, but again, those are those are good resources. But I, I think primarily I would I'd use Ping Jockey. Ping Jockey is a good one. Um, so looking ahead, um, this past December, I made my first 
222 megahertz meteor scatter contact. Um, there was a station uh, down in Florida, KO4MA, that uh, was on the, the 222 megahertz reflector, basically saying he, he wanted to make a contact. He only had 100 watts. And uh, he didn't really get any takers. And I basically told him, I'm like, I only have 100 watts, but I'll give it a try. And uh, this was uh, during the meteor showers in, in December. And lo and behold, we were able to make it. So that I was really thrilled about that. 1,100 miles for your first 222 megahertz meteor scatter contact. I, I think I'm basically hooked. Um, so this past fall, uh, I ran across uh, uh, a ham that was selling a surplus solid state um, uh, amplifier, TV transmitter amplifier. Um, and basically the long and the short of it is that you know, probably around 2001, this Canadian uh, TV uh, transmitting company was unloading a bunch of, called Larkin, was unloading a bunch of these, these solid state modules and a, a Canadian ham, uh, I guess, got a hold of some of these and started selling them to, uh, to the hams. Uh, and uh, the idea is basically they were hot swappable. They were, you know, like thousand watt, 1500 watt things. And they would put them into a chassis and, with a combiner. And, that, and, and that's how the thing worked. It was one of the, the earlier solid state amplifiers and they used a, a bunch of FETs in them uh, and, and, and combiners. Uh, and, and so uh, I basically picked up one that uh, would work for 222 megahertz uh, and um, my friend John Swinarski, K1OR, uh, has been helping me get the thing running. We, uh, uh, Freddie uh, and when DPM uh, was was instrumental as well. Uh, finally got the thing running. It's it's basically just a module. It, it doesn't have any control circuitry. There's no power supply. So all of the, obviously all that stuff needs to be built up. But the neat thing is it's you know it's it was fairly inexpensive. And it makes about 700 watts out with 12 watts of drive, which is sort of neat. And some of the some of the challenges, however, are like, you know, you got to, you know, you got to mount fans on it, and that's no easy chore. And I I I uh, I changed the side rails a little bit and 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 added a cover because these things were, if you notice, that the circuitry is is live there. It's 50 volts at 30 amps. So like, you know, you don't want to stick your hands in there. So it was important that you somehow put a cover on it. I mean, when these things were plugged into a chassis, there was no issue. So, you know, now I've got to get like a sequencer. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I got a couple of relays. I have a lot of work to do. So this is like a, a project for the future. But, you know, if I can work uh, meteor scatter and, and make a contact with 100 watts, imagine what I can do with 500 watts. You know, and this is this is a single Yagi. So, so here's just some additional information. If anybody cares to send me uh, an email, I can I can send you these links, or I can I can send you uh, the slide deck if you're if you're interested. Um, some just uh, some interesting things that I that I found that that you might find as well. Um, any questions? You know, I'm not really sure. So the uh, so the question was uh, about Doppler shift. You know, what, what's Doppler shift on on meteor signals, on meteors, and and uh, uh, I really don't have an answer for that. Um, I can't say I've experienced it. Yeah, I, I actually would because oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, can everybody? Hopefully, folks online can hear me. Um, if the Doppler shift is too great, the code will not. The the, you, the algorithm. Right. When you send this code, you're spreading energy, right? And in a in a given way, and you're counting on the person at the back end being able to reassemble that energy. If the Doppler shift is too great, bigger than one little baud of the code, then the code doesn't decode anymore, and you know, things drop over. However, maybe 
since you're scattering off a meteor trail, right? The right. meteor is coming in and burning up and it's leaving this trail. The trail just drifts with the local wind that's up in there. In fact, people use that to detect the neutral wind. Um, because neutrals don't scatter radio waves, but you watch the trails move, and that wind is not moving that fast. It's moving maybe 40, 50 meters a second. So it's not going to decorrelate enough for you to, to start doing. It. Joe designed that code specifically <coughs> knowing what that particular drift rate was. And there's error correction in there as well. And there's error correction in there, but he, he made sure that that was the case. Um, Would have it, to be very significant. Right. right. I actually had a question for you. Um, so there's two kind of meteors. There's the meteor showers that you were showing. And then there's sporadic meteors, which happen any day of the year, right? You know, any day we're running into debris as we go scoop up this stuff. As we're... So how's your success rate on the random days of the year as opposed to the showers? Or is that a selection effect where you're not online as much during a random event? So it's sort of hit or miss. So I'll get on... Uh, a Saturday or a Sunday, and some weekends will be better than others, and some won't. And then, you know, I might, I might have a, a Saturday where I'm able to work down into Florida and maybe a station out in Missouri on, on, on two meters, and I'll go, hey, this is a pretty good day. And then I'll have a weekend where I don't work anybody. But then, like, you'll have a, a, a media shower, and like overnight, you'll work like four or five people. And the reason you can't work any more people is sort of a, a compilation of things. One is a, a lot of people on one frequency. So, you know, uh, a local who's calling that's screwing you up. Um, and, and so what you'll do is you'll pick a different frequency. So if I'm 144.150, I may tell people, hey, I'm going to 155 or I'm going to 145 and, 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 and look for me there. I mean, so that's, that's one way around that. Uh, the other thing is, is that um, it takes long enough to work somebody that there's only so much time that you can dedicate to it. So if it takes me, I don't know, 20 minutes or so to work somebody, 20, 30 minutes, you know, in an evening, I can only work, you know, with maybe a half dozen people. And, there, and the activity level it is, isn't that, that high. So, you know, that's, that's the long and the short of it. Yeah, we've got a question online from Ed W1ZZ. From Ed W1ZZ. He's asking why only at He's night. Asking why. You know, that's a really good question, and I wish I had a really good answer for that. Um, there's probably a good reason for that, but you know, basically the the what I do know is that the the Earth's rotation causes most of the meteors to come in from the easterly direction, whether it's um, whether it's northeast or southeast, but you know, basically, uh, it, it doesn't come the opposite way. Um, I know that doesn't necessarily answer your question, but um, it's the best I have. Hey, Les. Yeah. Hey, Les. Hold on, let me change this. Well, so, change this. So the question is, uh, are, the are question spotting is, uh, are, are spotting um, Not necessarily. Uh, not necessarily. Uh, King Jockey is the is the best place. You and and people do spot the fact that oh, I hear K zero TPP out in Echo Mary twenty five. They they do that quite often. It is not good to spot like in the middle of a contact. Because basically, by doing that, you're invalidating the contact. You're helping somebody make a contact. But the idea that you know you can you can tell somebody that you hear them is uh, is is okay. You know, who's sending CQ? Um, one other thing I want to mention is, uh, and I, I should have put this in the presentation, is the use of a PSK reporter. Is, uh, is a really valuable tool. So many times I'll be uh, uh, on two meters and there's not a, a station uh, that I think can hear me. Nobody's responding to me. And I'll go on a PSK reporter and I'll look for stations that are reporting me on two meters using any mode. And you'll actually see a bunch of stations. They're just, there's nobody in the shack. 
So, so even even though um, even though no one's going to respond to you, it's nice to know that you're making it out and somebody's hearing you. So, PSK Reporter is a is an in, an interesting tool. I think there was another question online. Go ahead. Go ahead. Dallas, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Hi, hi, it's Eric. Um, on two meters, how, how much are people moving around, or is everybody generally hanging around the same uh, watering hole frequency? So uh, the, the so frequency the, the is one forty-four one fifty. But people also tend to use people also tend to use one forty. But during like a, a, but during a like a media shower, they can be at 140, 145, 150, 155. It's good to get on King Jockey. It's good to get on King Jockey. Look at the messages and, and, and find out. Look at the messages and find out. Okay, now I'm on 155 because it may be because uh, and and you know W1VD was was on 150. And, and all, all you hear is him transmitting. We're gonna put them all. <laughs> No, I'm, can't see I have no one, one of the one of the things about meteor scatter is I think when when uh, MSK 144 first came out I think a lot of people were really excited about it and and and, and the activity level for meteor scatter was huge and I think over a period of time the the popularity has waned a little bit and so the number of stations that are active are not as great as it used to be um, which is too bad um, you know it's it's not a it's not an easy mode to use contacts could either come very quickly or in the case of my 222 contact like take an hour and during that whole period of time you're you're transmitting every 15 seconds with the hope that if I keep sticking with it, I'm going to make a contact. So I, I will say that uh, it always intrigued me. I had, had sat and watched people on, on Mount Greylock do it, and I thought, you know, this is sort of cool, but really never thought much of it. And then when I when I got home, I thought to myself, well, this might be interesting. And I thought, well, I do FT8 on six meters. I have everything I need. Let's just see if it works. And so I, I, I learned the, you know, the ins and outs of it a little bit. And then I said, well, I have a two meter station. Well, I probably can't work anything on two meters. Well, let's give it a try. And I'm like, hey, this is, this is sort of neat. On two meters, I can do it with 100 watts. So you know, I, I, I encourage everybody to, at the very least, give six meters a try. It, it, you might be uh, uh, surprised that, you know, in, in uh, in January, you can work Florida on six meters. Sort of interesting. So the question is, um, can you do the same thing with tropo scatter? Um, I can't say I've tried that. It's an interesting idea. Anybody, uh, anybody else? Anyone online? All right, well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh